have all of you back for another Wednesday evening Bible study and prayer time. Good to have you. And we have been looking at the attributes of God and we looked at the divine attributes of God and now we're on to looking at the moral attributes of God. And we're answering the big question of what are the main attributes of God? Because God has a lot of attributes, you know. So we could have squeezed in more uh, 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 and so forth, but I'm really trying to just keep it in the main. So we have looked at the moral attributes of God and we've said that the moral attributes are, are the attributes which, 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 make, which depict God's personality. They are communicable, they are expressive, and they are um, attributes that have been passed on to us. It's just that God does them to perfection while we are able to demonstrate some of what God um, has given to us. So we have looked at, at three attributes, moral attributes so far. We've said that God is love. We said that God is holy. That was the first one, by the way, God is holy. And we said that God is love. Then we said that God is faithful. And I trust that looking at the moral attributes of God, the side, this side of God that, that speaks to his perfection, and uh, which he has and has given us, I trust that you are finding that God is really a personal God and a personable God, right? God is a person, by the way. He's a spirit person and spirit being. And so when he's, when he's holy, he wants us to be holy. When he is love, he wants us to show love. When he's faithful, he wants us to be faithful. So you're realizing that God sets the standard he is the standard bearer of all these attributes, and he wants us to do the same. But the other aspect of it, as you go through it, as we go through it, is to, is, is to realize that God, um, God, God wants to be related to. You know, we should relate to God, and he has made it possible for us to relate to him by giving us these personality traits. And so be faithful, be holy, love God, love people, you know. And so today we are going to get into some more attributes of God. I have at least three or four tonight. Not saying that I'm going to rush getting through all of them, but we'll see where it takes us tonight. And so good to have all of you. And so we are, I'm going to share screen now and we will get right into the fourth moral attribute, which is righteousness. God is righteous. Moral attribute number four. God is righteous. God is righteous. Righteousness is the carrying out of God's holiness and the expression of, of, of it. Let me, sorry. Um, and the expression of it in God's governance of the world. So righteousness is the carrying out of God's holiness and the expression of it in God's governance of the of the world. Meaning, righteousness is meaning that God always does what is right because he is incapable of doing anything that is wrong. All right? God always does what is right because he's incapable of doing anything that is wrong. All right? That is what we mean when we say God is righteous, all right? When we say that God's righteous indig indignation is righteous wrath, he carries out um, um, his holiness through righteousness. He expresses his holiness through righteousness. It is, it, 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 this is almost the idea of God acting then out his holiness. He is holy, and so he acts out his holiness through righteousness. He's, in other words, he's always going to do right. Do right by anybody, all right? And do what is right for everybody, all right? Some people may not always view things happening to them as righteous or right, but God still does what is right, all right? So the righteousness of God is a manifestation of his holiness. God's righteousness has been termed legislative holiness, all right? That's one of the terms people have called it righteousness, legislative holiness. This attribute reveals God's love of holiness and is the imposing 
of his righteous laws. And so this is how we have the Bible where he gives us um, the do's and the don'ts and the in-betweens as well, the, the principles, the moral principles to live by. And so righteousness is that acting out and, and stating the law of this is how I want you to live. For instance, let's make a distinction. When he says, be holy, for I am holy. The yes, that is indeed a commandment to be holy. But then righteousness now is that idea of he's going to get into what we call principles and guidelines of, of how to live holy. And so he would say something like, in the act of righteousness, be holy for I am holy. And in living right, here's, here's something that you need to do. You need to have pure thoughts or you need to you know, um, you know, forgive and so forth. Righteousness, that's righteousness, all right? So God is righteous, all right? So we're going to look now at some of the verses that encompass God's righteousness. Now, let me just say this. You've been seeing a number of verses, and I'm just also saying this, that there are many verses that speak to God's attributes, by the way. I'm just only just, you know, bringing out a few or so, you know. So there are other verses, you know. They're, they're, in fact, God makes sure that if, since the Bible is his book, he makes sure that he tells enough about himself in the book. So these are just samples, you know, examples of verses that speak to his righteousness and his holiness and so forth. But there are many verses you could find. It, it's splattered all over the Bible, Old and New Testament, of his attributes in verses. So when I pick some, some, some of them, yeah, I pick out some, some of the potent verses, while others are just what you call um, affirmations of his attributes. So as usual, I'm going to ask for some help. Um, as the verses in orange are always the ones I've chosen to read. And then I'm going to pick some persons as we go along to help me read some of the others. All right. So let's start with Rowena. Um, I'm going to assign you guys some verses. Rowena, I'm going to ask you to um, take John 17, verse 25. All right. Um, Charmaine, if you're there. Uh, I think I noticed your mic did unmute at one point, so I suspect it is working. <laughs> if anybody have chosen that your mic is not working or you're not in the position to read because your background is noisy, then give me a quick um, type in to say, Pastor, I can't read today. Just let me know. So I'm calling names and testing and trying. So Rowena, John 17, 25, Charmaine, Psalm 11, verse 7, and Skip to 45, verse 7. So, Shaman, you have those two verses there. Psalm 11, verse 7, and 45, verse 7. So that Psalm 119, verse 137. And let me see who is around there. All right. Sister Noreen. Um, Psalm 145, verse 17. Psalm 145, verse 17. So I trust that all of you have received your assigned verses, and I'll come down the line a little more with some and involve some others as we go along. So I will start with mine that I have right here, Daniel 9, verse 7. And in this passage before us, this was Daniel chapter 9, is a passage where Daniel was praying to God. And a lot of things happened in that prayer. One of those prayers that a lot of dramatics took place. Uh, and, and he was at the place, though, where he was also praying for himself and his and the nation of Israel and really confessing their faults and sinfulness to God. But he was highlighting God's righteousness while he did that. So the idea is in contrast to sinfulness, he highlights God's righteousness. So Daniel 9 and verse 7 says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. But unto us, confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and unto all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. And so he's comparing God's righteousness to our sinfulness and hit their sinfulness and say, God, you. You are alone righteous. In other words, what Daniel is saying in verse 7, you know, 
God, are you alone righteous? Because the rest are we. We have fallen short, man. We are sinful being, and you alone are righteous and belong to it. You are the epitome of righteousness. And skip to verse 14 and uh, into 16. It says, Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his work which he doeth, for we, ob we obeyed not his voice. We were disobedient. And it is because you are righteous that you have allowed us to be punished and judged. It is, it is because of God's righteousness. In now go stay there and just make me just go on, go on and, and just misbehave and so forth. It is because you're righteous. You have watched the evil, you've seen it, and then your righteousness is going to make you act on it. Verse 15. And now, O Lord, O God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and has gotten the renowned, re, the renowned meaning he has you know gotten his his name has gone out and people understand that he is the god that rescued them from egypt as at this day we have sinned we have done wickedly verse 16 is where i stop O lord according to all thy righteousness i beseech thee let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city jerusalem thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for their in the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. This righteousness is in total contrast to our sinfulness. All right, Rowena, John 17, verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. That's, that's Jesus Christ himself, you know, praying another prayer. And Jesus is calling his father righteous. Psalm 11, verse 7, and 45, verse 7, Charmaine. Psalm 11, verse 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. 45 verse 7, thou lovest righteousness and hatest mm -hmm. wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, mm -hmm. hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Yeah. Uh, you, you, the first one is like you say, your righteous righteousness. <laughs> and the second one is, is showing the contrast again. He loved righteousness but hates wickedness. Lovely. Um, Psalm 119 verse 137, that's so that. Righteous art thou, Lord, and upright are thy judgments. All right, very good, thanks. Psalm 145, verse 17, I think that's Mrs. Moran. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Uh, righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. And there are many more scriptures. God is righteous, my friends. Moral attributes of God. God is righteous. All right. If there are no questions, comments, we're going to move on to another moral attribute. The moral attributes, as I said, are easier to digest, um, easier to understand because we, as I said, have a little of it in us. And, and, and so there is no spectacular about it, but there is reverence. There, are reverence. there is reverence to his and beauty to his moral attributes. But it is easier to understand all right and easier to fathom that's why we don't have to spend much time on them to even debate and get into anything deep because it is quite understandable and acceptable fair enough all right so let's keep going so we said that god is righteous secondly all right god is just now can anybody unmute the mic and tell me what does just mean when we say God is just? What do we mean? Anybody have an idea? I'm certain somebody doesn't know. Anybody? Anybody at all? When we say God is just, what do we mean? J U S T. God is just. Still waiting. No feedback. God is just. You know what happens Fair. sometimes? That's a, yes. Who is it? Go ahead. Fear. Fear. Give, give me some more. Give me some more. Get what we me. Describe it in the realm of who God is, though. When you say fear, what do you mean? 
God honest. is just. Uh -huh. Honest, upright. Oh, honest, upright. Uh, oh, fear, that kind of fear. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I tell you, know, we don't know why they must make English so hard. I get you know that kind of fear. I was yes. thinking, oh, I must be the only one who did so slow, not you. Everybody said, oh, pass, I'm not getting it. Sorry, maybe that's think F E A <laughs> F E A R. <laughs> but I get you know, yes, F A I R. Yes, 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 yes. You had us at fear. Yes. <laughs> I don't run fear it out. <laughs> yes, fear, honest, yeah, upright. Yes, yes, yes. I think that was Bula. So indeed, yes, Bula. If it was you, I wonder where it was. Indeed, yes, yes. You hit the nail on the head with the fear. You had me at hello. <laughs> All right. So God is just he, he fear. All right. So let 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 let's get a working definition of it. The justice of God. Is that attribute whereby he cannot look upon sin nor tolerate wickedness. All right. As what one of the words that was used earlier too was upright. So his fear, he's upright. So the justice of God is that attribute whereby he cannot look upon sin nor tolerate wickedness. Justice is the execution of righteousness and has been termed judicial holiness. Righteousness was termed legislative holiness, where he lays down the law in righteousness and says, this is how you must live. But the justice now and the just be God being just, it's judicial holiness. This is where God is going to take action against sinfulness and sinful people. And notice I said it almost like in the future tense to going to. And he has done in the past. He is doing it now. But he has more action to take in the future. And the, the futuristic, the future tense of the just God's justice is what some people get impatient on. The idea of God, God going to, because if you read this first sentence, he cannot look upon sin or tolerate wickedness. I know that some people already start to have the antenna and ready to even ask the question. Then why, why is there so much wickedness on the earth since he cannot tolerate it? Or why am I wait for that, you know, he seemed pretty tolerant to me, you know, so, so some people, you know, would say, you know, boy, you know, is he really just there? No? Or he's just, but you remember that there's another side to him. And that's why, you know, we're almost answering one of the other questions that we will look at another time. But that's why, this is how you're going to help to answer some questions, like why do good things happen to bad people? And why do um, it seem like sometimes bad people don't get them good and they, when they deserve? You, you have to remember that there's a God who has um, attributes. And so the, uh, without going too far ahead, I just have to bring this in in order to balance it. So sometimes when people are asking, why is God tolerating wickedness when the definition of, of, of justice that he doesn't tolerate it? Why is he so why is he dragging his feet so much? You just remind him that there's another side to God. There are other attributes of God. He's merciful, he's gracious. And so I'm going ahead so we can explain that. Get it? So that when you don't see his when you don't see his, his action of justice yet, he's gracious, he's merciful, you know, he's long suffering. And so just bring those attributes so that people understand it. And he's giving people time to repent because there are some who are going to repent while others won't. And when they when their time comes and they don't, <laughs> then God is going to lay down the law of justice. And so, you know, you balance the thing. That's a good place to explain to people who don't know who are trying to figure out why God doesn't do this and why God allows this and so forth you just look at his attributes when you look at God's attributes then you will get a balanced perspective so us as believers we have to get this in our head first and we have to get in our heart first because if we don't get this and understand this we might have a difficulty explaining this and Mark my words, some of the unsaved, they are going to challenge us with this. They're going to ask these questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why God waiting so long? You know, so wicked, why God not just strike them down? What kind of God you are served? So some of you, if you witness or you evangelize some people, some of the unsaved in particular who are antagonistic to Christianity are going to ask those questions. And I'm saying to you, this study on the attributes of God is going to help you 
to balance the argument right, for them to at least try to see it from the perspective of God and the word, that he is a God who doesn't just act irrationally and rationally, you know, <laughs> you know, just act irrationally, let's leave it that irrationally, just, he doesn't just act irrationally and out of turns and out of character. I love that one. That, in fact, everything else somebody said before, if you never remember it, use this one. God is a God who does not act out of character. Argument done. <laughs> Anybody who will ask you why God not do this and why, just, just give them that line there. Me feel that one day will sell off. God is a God who doesn't act out of character. And so he's not an irrational God who is just going to just do things and just hasty and so forth. All in good time. That sound like good reasoning to you guys? Sound like good stuff? Eh? All right. Um, can I change the slide, please? Um, let me ask whoever said that. Um, did, did I? Are you guys not seeing God is just number five? Somebody just asked me to change the slide and I'm wondering. No, if... sir. You're stopped at God is righteous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. All right. All right. So let me repeat this then. Not everything I said before, but just this, since you weren't seeing it. The justice of God is that attribute whereby he cannot look upon sin, nor tolerate wickedness. Justice is the execution of righteousness and has been termed judicial holiness. All right. So let me move on. God's justice is manifested in his wrath when he punishes the wicked and demands justice for sin. God is just and will do what is fair. You see the word fair now, right? And will give everyone what they deserve, whether it be punishment or reward. So God's justice, my friends, is manifested in his wrath when he punishes the wicked and demands justice for sin. He, he as it said here, God is just and will do what is fair and will give everyone what they deserve. And this is the part that I feel is a clincher, whether it be punishment or reward. So the idea of God being just is that he's going to, justice is giving you what you deserve. It's giving me what I deserve. It's giving all of us what, what we deserve. That's justice. And so the truth is that there are some people, wicked people, who are going to deserve punishment. And so when God punishes wicked people, that is God's justice. But then there are some people who deserve a reward for being faithful. That's God's justice as well. Justice is, I'm going to be fair to you. You well done, though, good and faithful servant. This is your reward. Now, why does justice fit into that? Or God being just fit into a reward scenario? Because there are some people who get some earthly rewards that they did not deserve. Just a, a just God is not going to give people reward that they did not earn, that they did not deserve. That is why just fits there as well. So if you get a reward from God when you go to heaven, if you get three crowns, you can rest assured that there was no correct favor on God's part. That's why, you know, so there is no correct favor on God's part. But you got it because you earned it. God was fear. He was watching you all along. You know, there's nobody that can say, why Omar get, get all a three chrome? Why Pastor Matt get all a five chrome? Why that person get one? And so forth. You know, you know, nobody's here that they can contest God and to say, oh, because, oh, because you're a pastor, why you get so much? You know, God, you know, God bias, you know? Nobody can say that God is biased and so forth, even when it comes down to the reward system. Surely there might not be any debate when it comes down to the wicked. <laughs> when they get punished, nobody now going to debate that one day. But I know there won't be any debate in heaven either. No. But I'm saying that you know, on an earthly basis and earthly thinking, there are some people sometimes they will reward some people and sometimes some people really never deserve it. But when it comes down to a just God, he is going to be fear in all his dealings and the fairest way to deal with human beings is to give us exactly what we deserve exactly what we earned is exactly what we get exactly what we did are the consequences of our actions fear you can't get no fear than that so god is just all right my friends all right scriptures I will take the one in orange as per usual, Psalm 97, verse 1 to 6. 
and uh, I'm going to ask a few more people. Omar, I know you are there. So Omar, I'm going to ask you to take Deuteronomy 32, verse 3 to 4. Deuteronomy 32, verse 3 to 4, Omar. Lula, I know you are there. So I'm going to ask you to take Zephaniah 3, verse 5. That's Zephaniah 3, verse 5, Lula. All right. Oh, yes. Seanette, I don't know who you are, Seanette. I know it's you, BC. <laughs> so Seanette would take Psalm 89, verse 13 to 14. Seanette, Psalm 89, verse 13 to 14. All right. And um, I wonder if Sister Grace can take one for me because some of these are not seeing any names. Sister Grace, can you take Revelation 15, verse 3 to 4? I have to make sure I confirm this. Certainly, Sister sir. Grace. Certainly. All right. So you'll great. So you'll have Revelation 15, 3 to 4. So, and I'll take the Psalm 97 portion. It's the longest one. I'll save it for last. So Deuteronomy 32, verse 3 to 4. Omar. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe thee greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Just and right is God. And by the way, if you... If you do any studies at all, you, you will sometimes that word just or justice is used interchangeably with judgment, by the way. And I've always said it, that judgment is not always a bad thing. So sometimes the Hebrew word that is shared for justice is the same word that is shared for judgment in English. All right. All right. Zephaniah 3 verse 5. I think that should be Beulah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He yes. faileth not, but the unjust know it no shame. Yeah, yeah. The just Lord is gonna do right by you. If not do iniquity, if not, if not unfair, if not biased, if not corrupt favor, he's gonna do right. And he's gonna also see, see sin and deal with sin. One day, if not now, on our timetable, one day for certain. All right, um, Psalm 89, verse 13 to 14. I forget who made that sign after that. Sorry. Uh, oh, Sean, it. that should be Sean. It. Yes. yes. Psalm 89, 13. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment. Just, justice and judgment are, are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. All right. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to hit some after Revelation. So um, Grace, Sister Grace, Revelation 15, verse 3 and 4. Okay. Revelation 15, 3 and 4? Yes, yes. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb sing, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. Right, right. And as I said, sometimes that word judgment here is used interchangeably with the word justice, English, but the same Hebrew word they share, where you're gonna see that word judgment there to be used interchangeably with the word justice at the same time. So Psalm 97, verse one to six, these verses say, the Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of eyes be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. That word judgment there, righteousness and judgment, that's the same word for justice that is used in the Hebrew. Somebody has another translation, your translation might very well say righteousness and justice. It is not wrong. So you might say, but oh, my translation said justice and it said judgment. It is the same Hebrew word, all right? Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment or justice are the habitation of his throne. So his entire throne, he's clothed and enclosed with righteousness and justice. That's who God is. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. 
So, 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 so we don't have to fret about what is going to happen to our enemies and what is going to happen to the wicked. One day, God is going to just, you know, just rain down his justice upon them. His lightnings, God's lightnings, enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. Verse 6 is where I stop. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Our God is just. We talked about his righteousness and now we talked about him being just. So he is just and he is righteous. All right. If there are no questions, comments, we're going to keep going and we will look now at God is good. God is is good. So we talked about God being righteous and God being just. No, God is good. And, you know, and all the church say, God is good all the time. Finish it for me. And all the time. Yes, yeah, and all the time, God all is good. The time all the time, God is good. good. Very good. Want we'll to make sure something to keep awake. You know? God is good all the time and all the time, God is good. We say that phrase a lot. We, we you know, we from ever since that phrase was birthed into the churches, what, what, over long ago, maybe 10, 10 years ago, a decade ago, I don't know how long it has been around. But we've said that phrase, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. It, it's, 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 it's a great phrase that describes the, 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 this moral attribute of God. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. That's exactly that what it encompasses the meaning of God is good, all right? God is the perfect embodiment and source of all good. God himself is the ultimate good that we seek. Goodness, as the, 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 the word suggests, can be understood to mean worthy of approval. And guess what? I'm preempting myself, but I still say, no, I, I don't, I won't mention the verse, but when the phrase, when, when it says here, Goodness can be understood to mean worthy of approval. What that means you know, about God is that only God alone can be approved as good. Only God alone can be approved as, can I put another word in here then? Perfectly good. He is the only worthy one who meets the standard of perfect goodness. Worthy of approval. Goodness can be understood to mean worthy of approval. And so when we say that God is good, He is all good. He's good all the time, and all the time God is good. He's worthy of that accolade of being a good God. Amen. That's what we're talking about right there. So let's move on to the other statement. So the goodness of God refers to his loving kindness. This attribute, and by the way, sometimes people spit with that one. Some people you know, and here, you, as I said, you can go far and wide with these attributes. You can split them before you know it, you have about 20 attributes because you could split it to say loving kindness is also another attribute. Nothing wrong with that, you know, but it, 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 that's why we're talking about the main attributes because out of some attributes, attributes, sorry, flow other attributes. So the goodness of God refers to his loving kindness. This attribute of God, which is goodness, manifests his care and concern for his creation, but especially the believers. Because he's not just good to, is God, is God just good to the believers? Let me ask that question. Is God just good, only good to the believers? Is God only good to the believers? Somebody want to answer that one? Is not God at all. all. Not no. at all. He lets the rain fall on the yeah. just and the unjust. And the unjust. Exactly. He's good. He's good to, God, you see, sometimes, can I be honest with you? You have a few Christians who believe that God, only them alone, God good to you know. So in other words, if you if you want if you want if you want to um what's the word? If you want to um experience the word I was looking for, the goodness of God. Well, therefore, it only happens to those who are His. No, He's good to His creation <laughs> in general. You know, He's good. He's good to the animals. He's good. He's good to other human beings. And so, but He's especially good. To the believers everything about god is good all right so let's look at some scriptures so all right i will assign a few more people 
and I will take Luke 18 verse 19 as per usual. Let me see. All right, I know that Mr. Prout is there. So let me, I'm going to give Mr. Prout two verses. So Mr. Prout, I'm going to invite you to look up Second Chronicles 5 verse 13 and Second Chronicles 7 verse 3. That's the second set of verses right here. Second Chronicles 5 verse 13 and 7 verse 3. I think I saw Pat. Um, I'm not looking at some of the names anymore, so I hope I'm not wrong. If Pat is there, First Chronicles 16 verse 34. If Pat is there, I hope I'm not wrong. I hope. And then Angela, I think I saw Angela as well. Um, I will give Angela just two verses out of that one because they are almost all saying the same thing. Angela, you can take Psalm 52, verse 1, and just skip over to 1, Psalm 100, verse 4 and 5 when you're ready. So from the top, 1 Chronicles 16, 34, that would be Pat. 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13 and 7, verse 3, that would be Mr. Prout. Psalm 52, verse 1, and 100, verse 4 and 5, that would be Angela. And I am actually in Psalm myself. So I think I'll just read Psalm 107, verse 1 to 6. All right. So here goes, First Chronicles 16, verse 34. First Chronicles 16, verse 34. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. All right, all right. For he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. All right, thank you. Mr. Prout, Second Chronicles 5, 13, and 7, 3. Second Chronicles 5, Verse 13, indeed it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good for his mercy endures forever. That the host of, that the host, the host of the Lord was filled with a cloud when all the children of is Second Chronicles seven verse three. When all the children of Israel saw yeah. how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, "For He is good; for His mercy endures forever." Thank you. You notice what is following that He is good; His mercy endures forever. There are some attributes that they almost, it's almost like they follow each other. They link with each other. If you notice, righteousness and justice, goodness and mercy. That's why surely goodness and mercy shall be. Anyways, um, let me stop preaching. Psalm 52, verse 1 and 100, verse 4 and 5, which is Angela. Psalm, Psalm 52, verse 1. Why boast this is all thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. Mm -hmm. In 100 verses 4 and 5, mm -hmm. it says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his course with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Ah, indeed. You see it. You see it. You see it. You see it. You see. You see the tying again. The linkage. Good and mercy. The Lord is good. All right. I have Psalm one hundred and seven before me. Psalm one hundred and seven, and I'll read verses one to six. And I've left out some of the other verses because they're you know practically saying the same thing, but you have them there as reference to show you again many verses that expose the attribute or this particular attribute of God. Psalm 107, reading from verse 1. He says, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Uh, boy, I'm almost here to preach, you know. That's why I'm saying I want to read Psalm 107. <laughs> Guys, if you are redeemed, if you are saved, if you are revived, if you are a child of God, that verse is saying, those of us who are redeemed, those of us who know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, those of us who have been delivered, <laughs> say so. Those of us who know God, those of us who have been delivered from all kinds of stuff, we delivered from hell, death, and the grave, with the penalty of all of that, 
let those who are redeemed talk out, open up your mouth and say, yes, God, you are good. So let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the land from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And we could go on and on. It's showing how good God is. When they, when they needed him the most, they cried out to him and he delivered them. That's the kind of good God we have. When you need him the most, he's always there. And when you think you don't need him, he's still there. <laughs> he's just good. All right, because remember, one of his attributes is also faithful, so he's always good. No, the final verse under this goodness is Luke 18, verse 19. So Jesus was the one who stated this, and uh, he was approached by I think it was a, a ruler or something, and he, yes, a certain ruler, verse 18. He was approached and he says, and a certain ruler asked him, Jesus, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus did not answer that question right away. What he did was to address the description. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. That is God. Let me, let me paraphrase that. Why are you calling me good? There is no other person good but God. Only God alone. That's why I say, yo, yeah, we're, 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 there, are no, there are some nice people on this platform. There are some good people here. But remember, I said it much earlier. When we talk about, this is where I wanted us to get. When we talk about, maybe I should back it up right here. When we talked about it, God is perfect embodiment and source of all good. God himself is the ultimate good that we seek. I'm going back to that. Goodness can be understood to mean worthy of approval. So when Jesus says, why are you calling me good? I wonder if he says, he's saying to this, 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 this ruler, do you understand that only God is good? Do you understand by the way, Jesus is also saying that I am God. I am the good God. But only God alone is perfectly good. Only God alone has goodness to perfection. And so he, that's why this, this psalmist says goodness, not just righteousness, and other psalmist says goodness belongs unto you. When it talks about the idea of belongs to you, in other words, only you alone have amassed goodness in, in its perfection. God alone is the good God. All right? Amen. Amen. All right, um, let me see. Yeah, I have two slides left, we can finish it up. Um, we could skip a few verses to finish it up too, because you guys are getting this. Um, finally for tonight, God is merciful. You, and, and, and it's good to finish it up because that's one of the attributes that's been linked to his goodness. He's good and he's merciful. He's good, his mercy endured forever. You see a lot of those scriptures. This attribute of mercy emanates from the love of God. All right? It, it, it spreads from it. It, 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 it. it derives from it. It's love. Because God is love, he's merciful. So mercy emanates from the love of God. Mercy is the removal, I love this, or withholding of a just penalty. God's mercy is a holy, um, God's mercy is a Holy mercy, <laughs> I love this, which knows how to pardon sin but not protect sin. I love that. I don't know, I don't know if there's anybody that's loving this. I like that statement. That is from a theologian. God's mercy is a holy mercy, which knows how to pardon sin but not protect sin. Wow. You see, you see, and, and the reason why, the reason why that is there is because, again, there are people who would say that at times God is too merciful. You know, how would God have mercy on a, 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 a murdering, thieving, you know, and, and all kind of stuff, raping person and all those kind of stuff who call on them and say, Lord, I am sorry, forgive me. How would God forgive these people and have mercy? You see, he is a holy God. 
and he, his mercy is also holy. In other words, his mercy has to be perfect. So he knows how to pardon sin, but not, sorry, for, yes, pardon sin, but not protect sin. So he, you see, he can have mercy without condoning sin. He can have mercy without covering up sin. You see, mercy is not to the sin. Mercy is to the sinner. I love that. Mercy is not for the sin. <laughs> mercy is for the sinner who repents. Mercy is towards the person, not the practice. So mercy is the removal or withholding of a just penalty. So when you couple that with just, he's a God who will give you what you deserve. Mercy sometimes, you know, mercy sometimes comes now, and I want to be careful with the word, but I'm using it so you get the difference. Mercy sometimes comes now in direct contrast to just, because mercy sometimes will say, I am going to withhold your just penalty. I am going to withhold what you do deserve. That's mercy. And when God decides to have mercy on somebody, he's saying that you may, might have deserved hell, but because you repented, you're not going there. You might have deserved death, but because you repented, I will not kill you. You might have deserved this and that and that, but because you are sorry, I will have mercy. So I'm, I'm hoping that you guys are getting how to argue. Now, I want people don't want the word argue, but how to articulate is a better word. When people, people ask you why God still so, why God not just do this and why God not just do that, just remember this attributes, his character. I hope, I'm hoping that it's helping some of you to understand as well as answer some of these questions. Why does God do certain things? Because in his mercy, he must respond to repentance. And then if repentance doesn't take place in his justice, he must punish sin. All right? So he is merciful. And I love this. I love this. You know, he's holy and he is, you know, merciful. All right? So let's look at a few um, verses. Um, I'll, just, I'll just read Exodus 34. Well, I'm going to find it fast. Exodus 34, verse 6. And then I'll skip to Psalm 103. Exodus 34, verse 6. Says, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, that is Moses, the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed. The Lord has proclaimed this by the way, you know. The Lord, I tell you, God is, only God alone can do them something, you know. God is passing before Moses and then talking about himself in this way. In other words, God is passing Moses and declaring this about himself. Only God alone can do that, you know. <laughs> the, the, he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Ah, you see the balance there? I want to read it again, you know. And you see the balance of his character coming out? So, so, so. Not because I'm merciful means I'm going to make sin, I'm going to protect sin. So I'm going to read it again. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, up unto the third and to the fourth generation. In other words, God is a merciful God and he has, he has mercy and a whole for people and so forth. But if people are guilty and they are unrepentant, don't worry, God not going to make them get out of it. Not because I'm merciful, God said, means I'm not just. And not because I'm just don't mean I cannot have mercy. And, and so there are different scriptures that speak to his mercy. And one of them is that he said, if somebody asks God, why you have mercy upon that person there? Why have mercy upon a wicked person? Then God will just tell it to your face. Say, I will have mercy and why will I have mercy upon you? I am God. I will choose. Do you remember that verse? All right. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy upon. And so that's God. All right. Let's go to Psalm 103, verse 8 to 18. And the rest of the verses, New Testament wise as well, are saying the same thing about his mercy. But since that one is long, we'll stop there for tonight. Psalm 103, verse 8 to 18. Psalm 103, verse 8 to 18. It says here, 
the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither, he's not, he's not gonna always, um, you know, rebuke you and, and, and buff you and buff you <laughs> and beat you. He, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins. He has not always given us what we deserve. He has not always dealt with us according to what we have done wrong. Wow. Nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Nor always dropped the consequences that we do deserve. Wow. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. I love this passage, you see? He remember that we are dust. In other words, God remember that we are human beings. And that is why he chose, he chooses to have mercy. Why I tell you, this is a God that I just love. Because here's the thing I want to hurry up and say to you know. You can't tell him once you have this kind of mercy, you know. You can't tell him, say, all right, you know, you can beg him, you know. You can beg him all you want. Feel free to beg him. Right? So I'll beg him for mercy. But I'm telling you that you cannot, you can't read God either. Uh, that, this, this is something I have to say before I go any further. You can't read God and study God to say, oh, God said merciful, so I'm going to have mercy for me after I'm going to do this 100 times. You know, every 100, every 100 times when I say, and you say, he must say, you can't read God that way to say it is going to be a prescribed mercy. He will have mercy on who will have mercy, and then he'll have justice and who will have justice on. So there are times, if you, if you just simply remember some people in scripture, like, for instance, is Moses and the rod, you know, Moses could have get to the mercy, you know, but God just choose to use it and make an example of time and say, because you have disobeyed, you spoke to the... Yeah, you struck the rock instead of speak to it. I'm going to make an example out of you. And you shall not see the promised land. And in other words, let me put that away. You shall not enter into it. And so he never entered into it. But in beg God, Moses begged God and said, Let me at least see it. And he said, All right, go, go stand up here, Sam, so let me show you. That's, a, that's God's mercy. But he make sure say, he said, You're not going there. <laughs> so, so we can't study God. Don't try to. Study God. Don't try to manipulate his characters. Don't try to do that at all. It's not going to work. You know? So, but going back to the, the, the fulcrum of this verse and passage here is that, yes, he does have mercy. And so he remembers that we're human beings. And that, for me, is precious. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. Please note this, this part here. To those who are trying, and on the way more than those who just live in any hope, but to those who are trying, you're trying to keep his covenant and doing your best. What you feel, God said, oh, all right, I have mercy because you're trying. It's not talking about the wicked who continue to just blitz and fly up in a God face and then just want mercy, 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 mercy. It's those who are trying. And so indeed, God is a good God and he's a merciful God. We can stop there for tonight if there are no more questions. No more. Were there any? <laughs> there are no more. If there are no comments, then we'll stop there for tonight. And I'm going to end this segment in prayer. Then we're going to take prayer requests and pray for the relevant um, requests. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for showing us yourself. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm totally loving this. I'm totally enjoying this. I'm totally filled up by this because exposing yourself to us in this way through your word reminds us of who you are and who the relationship we have in you. What a precious God you are. Thank you, God, for showing this to us, for reminding us of who you are. If we had forgotten that you're merciful, you're good, you're just, you're faithful, you are righteous, you are holy, you are love. And God, we praise you and we honor you. We thank you. Lord, let us get to know you more because it is obvious that you are not a hard and wicked God. And you're not a far and a part, God. 
you're very near, you're very close, and you're very personal. Time for us to get to know you better. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.